This morning we continue our series, Built to Last. And I want to talk about the way of wisdom, the way of wisdom. Proverbs chapter 4, please, verses 5 through 9. This is an appeal. Get wisdom, get understanding. Do not forget nor turn away from the words of my mouth. Do not forsake her and she will preserve you. Love her and she will keep you. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. And in all your getting, get understanding. Exalt her and she will promote you. She will bring you honor. And when you embrace her, she will place on your head an ornament of grace, a crown of glory she will deliver to you. We can see here an appeal really a parental appeal of uh, parents to their children to get wisdom and to get understanding and the importance and the significance of wisdom. Then we can see in Proverbs chapter 9 some of the ways of wisdom. As we look into Proverbs chapter 9, verse 1 through 6, it says, Wisdom has built her house. She has hewn out seven pillars. Seven is a significant number in Scripture. It always speaks of the, the deity or God himself. And so wisdom is building, but building according to the plan of God. Wisdom isn't just going about randomly building. Wisdom is building <clears throat> according to the plan of God. Now notice, she has slaughtered her meat. She has mixed her wine. She has also furnished her table. She, and she has sent out her maidens. She cries out from the highest places of the city, whoever is simple, let him turn in here. As for him who lacks understanding, she comes to him, come eat of my bread and drink of the wine that I have mixed. Forsake foolishness and live and go in the way of understanding. <clears throat> so here we see that wisdom is building according to the plan of God. And then there's <clears throat> things that wisdom delegates and gives to others to do and makes an appeal for everyone who lacks wisdom to come and to sit and to dine with her and that she would give them counsel and instruction in a way to live. Now let's parallel that with something that, Matt, uh, that Matthew's gospel records about the ministry of Jesus. Matthew chapter 7, as Jesus is finishing his message known as the Sermon on the Mount, he sums it up by saying this, Therefore, who, who hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain descended, the floods came, and the wind blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain descended, the floods came, the wind blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. So if there's one thing that separates the wise from the foolish in this text. The wise person is a doer of the things that he's been instructed in. The wise trust and have faith and are obedient. And the foolish, though, are just the opposite. The fooler, foolish is just a hearer but not a doer. They're deceived into believing that just knowing something is just as important as the application of that knowledge that they've gained. But it's not. Remember, it's in doing something with what we know that pleases God. So we could sum it up in this way. One person had faith. The other person didn't. One person expressed their faith. The other person didn't. There's a real fine line there. You know, knowledge is very important, but the application of the knowledge is more important. You know, to know to do good and not do it is the biblical definition of sin. When we have knowledge, when wisdom gives us counsel, when wisdom comes into our life and speaks to us and we don't do what wisdom asks us to do, then when the storms of life come, then what happens is we get moved by the storm. But the wise person, wise person, those that heard what wisdom had to say and then applied her counsel when the storm comes, they continue to stand after the storm passes. Sometimes we wonder, how is it I got from here to here? What moved me? off the rock, what moved me off my foundation. It was not applying the knowledge that we had. When the storm comes, it's time to apply the knowledge that we have, that's faith. Our trust in God, our reliance upon Him, our belief in Him. 
So here's a question that I ask myself that maybe this will help you when you face the storms of life, temptations, trials. What does my faith teach me to do? What has my faith taught me to do? And then that's what I apply. Now, if I don't have an answer to that question, I go back and I sit and I take counsel from wisdom. Wisdom, what would you have me to do? In what way would you have me to react and to respond? And until I get wisdom, it's not very wise of me to do anything, is it? Wisdom is the principal thing. Get wisdom, and with all you're getting, get understanding. So when we're facing the unknowns in life, what are one, what's the primary thing that we need? Wisdom. If you've never been there before, you've never faced it, you've never been in that scenario before, wisdom becomes your partner to help you through the trial of life. And the good news is, is God's wisdom is available to us and accessible because of Christ Jesus. So wisdom is the proper application of knowledge and godly understanding. And when we apply the instruction of godly wisdom, we mature, we develop, we grow not only in the fruit of the Spirit and all the characteristics of Christ, but we grow as people. You grow in your confidence. You grow in your self-esteem and your self-worth. You also grow in your compassion and, 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 and care for other people. Wisdom builds into your life. Wisdom never takes away. Wisdom never tears down. Will, wisdom builds into your life. So not only do you have more of the fruit of the Spirit that is going to be born in your life, you yourself are a healthier person. You're happier. How many of you know that healthy people are happy people? Amen. And you know, when you're healthy in your soul, you're going to be healthy. You're going to be happy. And it doesn't matter where you are or what you're doing because wisdom is your instructor. And she is helping you to live where you are in a way that's pleasing unto your maker. She's teaching you. All we have to do is have an ear to hear and then a heart to apply those things that we hear. And then God says, you're in a beautiful position. No matter what the storm or the type of storm that comes, whether it's the wind or the rain, whether it's the earth shaking, you're going to be able to stand. And you're going to have what? Knowledge and understanding. You're going to gain in life. You're going to grow in life. Your self-esteem. You're going to be more secure, more stable. You're not going to go and be vacillating between two opinions. You're going to be steadfast. You're going to be immovable. You're going to learn how to abound in the work of the Lord. Now, I know that's a process. None of us get there overnight. But isn't that a wonderful truth to know that when we're abiding in Him and He's abiding in us, that we're going to bear fruit and He's going to be glorified? And as believers, ultimately, that's what we want our life to do is to glorify the Lord. So wisdom is the principal thing. Turn with me back to the book of James because Pastor James has a way of saying things that just gets right to the core of the matter. James, if you would please, chapter 3. And James, in these portions of Scripture that we're going to read, he's going to share with us that there's two kinds of wisdom that are working in the earth today. In James chapter 3, verse 13 through 18, he begins by asking a question. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. Now, godly, godly wisdom is not proud or arrogant. Godly, godly wisdom is humble and contrite and broken. When godly wisdom is, is operative in our life, it doesn't puff us up. It glorifies the Lord. So if, who is the wise who has understanding among us? It should be shown by our good works that are done in the meekness, tenderness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your heart, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, demonic, for where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. 
But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. All right, one thing before we look at the two different types of wisdom here is that the end of godly wisdom is peaceable. It produces peace, not division. It builds, it strengthens, it upholds, it unifies. And so worldly wisdom is categorized in this way. It's sensual, or it's just based on the senses. We would say this is the Thomas kind of faith. I'm not going to believe unless I see. I'm not going to believe unless I can feel something. It's demonic. In other words, there's an element of deception or darkness with worldly wisdom. It's self-seeking and is driven by selfishness and envy. And this type of wisdom produces confusion, doubt, and unbelief. The, the word evil in Scripture does not mean that like and uh, sometimes we think, you know, that was evil or that was dark. Evil primarily means a heart that refuses to believe. Before the Lord, that, that is probably the worst condition of the human heart. Someone who refuses to believe. Someone who refuses his counsel. Because someone refuses his counsel, it opens up the door for doubt, for unbelief, for deception and darkness and every evil work to begin to manifest through that individual because they will not adhere to godly counsel. So what are they left to? They're left to their senses. They're left to trying to figure everything out with their understanding. And faith is not operative in their life. That's, the, that's sort of the path and the result of natural or earthly wisdom. But then he contrasts that with something that is glorious and something that Christ has made available to us and God wants all of us to experience. And that is heavenly wisdom. Heavenly wisdom is pure or it's clean. It's never tainted. It's beautiful. It's peaceable. It's gentle. It's willing to yield. It's full of mercy and it's full of good fruit. And so we can see they are complete opposites one of the other. Where one refuses to hear... Right, Godly wisdom and those that desire godly wisdom and have a heart for godly wisdom are open and receptive to counsel. Even if it corrects them, even if it gets on their toes, even if it convicts them, they welcome that because they know it will cleanse them. It will purify them. It will make things peaceable with them. It will cause them to live a life apart from hypocrisy and partiality. They'll treat everyone with respect. They'll be a peacemaker. They'll be a bridge builder. This is the wisdom of God that's operative in our life. How many of us have ever experienced confusion, Doubt, unbelief, and all the evil works that come along with this. Have you had enough of that fruit? I've, I've experienced it. We would say that is the way of man. That's the way of flesh. It's not the path or the way of Christ. Now, here comes Christ into our life. And he partners with us. And he says, I have a different path. I have a different plan. And you're going to have to apply your faith and your trust in me. But, but rest assured, when you do so... There's something coming that's not from the earth. It comes from above. And since it comes from above, it elevates our life. It elevates you above the natural, above that which is just sensual, above all deception and darkness, and it brings you into a relationship where there's light and there's liberty and there's a path forward for you without any confusion. You know, God is not the author of confusion. God is the author of peace. So we can all ascertain which type of wisdom we've operated in before. If we're fighting for our own rights and we're trying to convince everybody that we're right, that's called self-justification, correct? But if we lay aside our rights and we take up our cross, and we follow Christ, that's called faith. 
And now we're justified only through Christ, and we want to do things that are right before Him. That produces different results in our life. We're more patient with people. We're less critical. We're kinder. We're more patient. And at the same time, we grow, develop, mature, and are changed. So James lets us know there's two different kinds of wisdom. God's wisdom, here's the beautiful picture, is available to those who ask, seek, and desire her. She doesn't come to everyone. She comes to those who ask for her, those who seek for her, those who desire her. It comes from above, and therefore it protects us from foolishness. Foolishness can be likened unto doing the same thing over and over again and thinking we're going to get different results. I know some people say that's the definition of insanity, but how many of you know insane people are foolish? They do the same thing over and over and over and over, and somehow they think they're going to get different results. We have to sometimes just move on to something that's better. We've tried that. It didn't work. We all were confused. It created division, not unity. So let's move on and let's begin to desire and seek and ask for the wisdom that comes from above. I've imagined times in my life where I've just sat down with different people in Scripture. And if I had an audience with them and had an opportunity to ask them questions, um, I would go through that scenario. And I did that in regards to wisdom. This week, I pulled up a chair in my study at my house, and I sat in one chair, and I just imagined wisdom with all of her beauty and all of her attributes, walking into my study and sitting down in the chair. And I ask wisdom this question. What are the most important lessons you want me to know? Teach me your ways. I'm interested in what you have to say. And of course, we have a book designated in Scripture that's known as the Book of Wisdom. It's called what? Proverbs. Ever say Proverbs? And so the Book of Proverbs tells us a lot about wisdom. Fifty-four times in the Book of Proverbs, in the 31 chapters, wisdom is the subject matter. So it's a primary theme through the book. And so a proverb a day keeps foolishness away. But it's not just the knowledge of what wisdom is sharing with us. Remember, it's the application of that. Wisdom not only gives us knowledge, she gives us the understanding of how to apply that knowledge. And then she says, you're building well. So I just imagined I welcomed her into my study and I say, what are your ways? What are the primary things you want me to know? And I wrote down three after spending some time listening to her. If you would go back with me to the book of Proverbs, and we're going to start in the ninth chapter. Everybody still with me? Proverbs chapter 9. And this is the first thing that she said to me. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. For by me your days will be multiplied and the years of life will be added to you. If you are wise, you are wise for yourself. And if you scoff or mock or belittle things, you bear it alone. Wisdom says to us, it all starts with the fear of God. That's where it begins. The foundation of any good life begins here. This is how you will begin to be built to last. The fear of God will free us from the fear of man and the fear of God teaches us to be more eternally minded than temporal minded. When wisdom is operative in our life, she's not only teaching us about the here and now, she's teaching us about the hereafter. 
She's preparing us for the hereafter. Not only does she help us with the decisions we're making here, she is actually preparing us to stand before him. She's always thinking about the bigger picture. She never thinks small. She always thinks big. Since she's a builder, she does things one step at a time. First she lays her foundation, then she begins to build on that foundation. Wisdom counsel comes to us as needed, just like building happens as it unfolds. You can't do five things on a building site at the same time. One follows the other, follows the other. That's how things are built. That's how things are sustained. And that's what wisdom does. The first foundation stone that she lays in our life is a reverence, a fear, and a respect for God. Because apart from that, we're not on a sure foundation. The rock of our salvation is based on the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord will cause us to live a pure life, a clean life, a separate life, a holy life. And we know what fear means there. It means that we love God more than that we love anybody else or anything else. We love God so much that we would not put an idol before him. We love God enough that he would have first priority in our life. That we would think of him before we think of ourselves, And then we would think of others before we would think of ourselves. That's what wisdom teaches us. Wisdom would teach us that in meeting the needs of God and others, your needs are automatically met. The wisdom from the world is self-seeking. The wisdom from, a, from above is not self-seeking. We live in a self-seeking culture. Do what makes you happy. Do what feels good. Do what makes your world right. But that doesn't make the world a better place. The wisdom from above comes and says, die to yourself so you can be alive to God. That takes faith, doesn't it? Trust, a relationship, pliable, meekness. Yes. How many of us have been bit by the bug of me first? Yeah. Now we know where that, that voice or that kind of counsel or that kind of wisdom can cre create some problems. Bring it into your home. How does that work? When it's all about me. It should be all about us. How's that work in a marriage? Doesn't work real good, does it? Doesn't cause peace and unity and harmony. When do I get to do what I want to do? Self-seeking, envy, jealousy. All of those things. Now, we've all done it. So we can, you know, either say, oh my or oh me. I mean, we can either laugh and say, yeah, that's really good. Or we can say, move on, pastor, move on. That's enough of that, right? Now, just as a reminder, because I like throwing this out occasionally, just to sort of stir the pot, because I'm not against stirring the pot. I've been free from the fear of man for a long time. And so here it is. If we were at a Joyce Meyer meeting, four of you ladies would stand up and say, Oh, I love it, Joyce. That's so good. Oh, just preach it. In your home church, you sit and act really sanctified. Isn't it amazing? Isn't it amazing? You go somewhere, you pay a lot of money, you pay a hotel, airfare, a conference fee. You go there, you're with a lot of other people that you don't know, and all of a sudden, you come out of your shell. Oh, that's so good. I love you, Joyce. Oh, preach it. In your own home church, you sit on your hands and say, he ain't talking to me. I don't know who he's talking to, but he ain't talking to me. Ain't none of this apply to me. I've never had these challenges. I've never had to deal with division or forgiveness issues or strife issues or anything. I, have I got a halo over my head. I'm so right. Everybody say, oh, come on, let's quit that, right? I give you liberty to be yourself. Woo! 
Don't be afraid of other men. So it all starts with the fear of the Lord. Then she would say to me, Desire, seek, and ask for my counsel. Proverbs chapter 2. Proverbs chapter 2, verses 1 through 9. My son, if you receive my words and treasure my commands within you, so that you incline your ear to wisdom and apply your heart to understanding. Yes, if you cry out for discernment and lift up your voice for understanding, if you seek her as silver and search for her as hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He's a shield to those who walk uprightly. He guards the path of the justice and preserves the way of his saints. Then you will understand righteousness and justice, equity, and every good path. She would say to me, I am available if you will search for me like you would search for gold. And if you search for me like you search for gold, you will find me. And when you find me, you find life. You find the knowledge of life, the understanding of life. You'll gain discernment in life. Your life will get bigger when you find me. But we have to ask for her. We have to search for her. We have to desire her. Now, that isn't just asking occasionally. That's asking a lot. Ask daily. Lord, thank you for a spirit of wisdom. Thank you for a spirit of counsel today. There might be things that I'm facing that I've never faced before. Decisions I have to make that I've never had to make before. Pressure I feel that I've never felt before. Temptations I will encounter that I never imagined I would encounter. Grant unto your son or daughter wisdom. Thank you for your wisdom when I need it. Then get into the word because the word will give you wisdom. God's words are food for those that sit down at her table. So ask and seek and desire for my counsel. The third thing that wisdom would say to us is stay pliable, tender, and teachable. And she would remind me that pride is a formidable foe. Proverbs chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. This is an appeal. Hear, my children, the instruction of a father, and give attention to no understanding, for I give you good doctrine. Do not forsake my law. When I was my father's son, tender, and the only one in the sight of my mother, he also taught me and said to me, Let your heart retain my words, keep my commandments, and live. You know, there's... There's not much uh, that, there's not a, anything that you can substitute for being pliable and teachable and tenderhearted. It, it's one of the, the necessities to continue to develop, to grow, and to mature in life. Uh, a hard heart won't grow. A calloused heart uh, can't receive, can't hear, can't understand. You can talk to someone with a calloused heart all day long, and they'll never understand. You might as well go talk to that doorknob over there. You'd probably have more interaction with that doorknob. At least it can turn to the right and to the left. At least it can swing on its hinges if you open it up. You talk to someone who's calloused in their heart. They don't turn to the right or the left. And to open up and to hinge the door of their heart to hear more, they keep it closed. They have it all figured out. They know everything, and you can't help someone who's that in, in that condition. Wisdom would say to us, first, it all begins, it all starts. The origins of everything that I want to build in your life starts with you fearing God. That you were made by Him, and one day you will return to Him, and that's a reality. That no one lives or dies unto himself, that somehow in God's miraculous plan we're all connected and isn't it amazing how Satan works so hard to disconnect us through the course of our life? 
it should show us, it should really, really show us that there is a spiritual battle that's going on in the world today. It all starts with the fear of the Lord. Secondly, wisdom would say, I'm here every day. I'll be here for you every single time. And if you'll look for me in the morning, if you'll seek and ask and knock and desire me during the new time, if you'll cry out to me in the evening hours, I'll be your counselor. I'll comfort you. I'll come and help you. But most importantly, don't allow your heart to become hard. Don't allow this world to make you calloused. Don't allow the situations of life to cause you not to be pliable. Because at that moment, you won't hear one thing I have to say. You won't understand one word that I'm sharing with you. You'll lack discernment to everything I'm trying to unfold to you. So fight with everything that you have within you. Not to let pride come in, because she is a formidable foe. Don't say, I know. Say, teach me more. Don't say, I understand. Say, help me understand more. Don't say, I'll, I've heard that. Say, let me hear it again. There's a big difference between having a conversation with someone who's pliable and those that aren't. Have you ever had a conversation with someone who doesn't hear one word you say? I've even had those conversations with myself. I look at myself and I say, Doug, what are you, and what are you doing? Were you, were you paying attention? What in the world were you thinking? Well, I don't know. Can you tell me? And, you know, you just have those moments in life. So the way of wisdom. What is the way of wisdom? The fear of the Lord. The way of wisdom is available to those who seek and knock and ask. And the way of wisdom is always speaking to those that are pliable. Remember, the fool keeps doing the same thing and think he's going to get a different result. Somehow they're going to, you know, prove it's like mathematical pop, uh, uh, probabilities. You know, if I do this a thousand times, well, surely one time I'll get a different result. Not if you do the same thing. The mathematical probabilities of getting a different result of, by doing the same thing is still zero. And so in the world of Jethro Bodine, not plus not equals not, you just end up being a knothead. So let's not do that, okay? <laughs> so wisdom is saying, get over here on this different path and listen and be pliable. And above all, do what I'm asking you to do. How many times, and I'm closing now, have we done this with wisdom? God, I just need direction. I need wisdom. I need clarity. Lord, there's things happening at work that I don't understand. There's people that are behaving in ways that, Lord, is just unexplainable. So help me to have the tongue of the wise, the mind of Christ, and the heart of compassion as I go to work today. In Jesus' name, amen. Get in our vehicle, we drive to work, we walk in. Nothing at work has changed. People are behaving in ways we don't understand, doing things that are like not even in the policy book. Didn't we all read the same policy book? <laughs> and, and going about things in a self-seeking manner. And in those moments, we have decisions to make. How we're going to treat them, how we're going to interact with them, what we're going to say to them. And wisdom will teach us all of that. Sometimes she says, don't say anything. They're not ready. Sometimes she asks us to give them an invitation. You know, if you need help with that, all you have to do is ask. If you don't know what you're doing, I'm available. Just let me know. You know, wisdom will give us enough rope almost to hang ourselves, and then she won't. She'll come and rescue us. She'll do the same thing with other people. I'm here. And you give that invitation in hopes that someone responds to it. 
Because if they ask or they seek, that means they're probably ready to hear. If they don't ask or they don't seek, it means that you can't say anything else to them. Even though you have things to say to them, you can't say anything else to them. So that is a good way that wisdom operates in that scenario. Now let me give you another alternative that sometimes we fall prey to more than what we like to admit. And that is same scenario, same work environment, and now we go in, but instead of going in gently, patiently, purely, we go in like a bull in a china closet. And boy, we just cause all kinds of damage. And sometimes we even spiritualize it. You know what God told me to tell you, Pierce? About that time, Pierce, wall goes up, understandably so, and he's like, uh, no, and did I ask? <laughs> yeah. Sometimes we even do scenarios like this. We pray to God, then we get on our phone, or him forbid, social media, and we start telling everybody else what God's telling us about ourselves, but we think it's not only if it's good for me, it's got to be good for everyone, right? If God's talking to me about this, surely he's talking to Reva. Reva, you need to hear what God's telling me because I think it's not just for me, I think it's for you. And you know, sometimes the wisdom that God gives me in a scenario is different than what God would give somebody else to do. He's that diverse. He's that big. And yet sometimes we think it's all like a cookie cutter. I told this, this person and they did this and that happened. And so if I tell this person this and this. And... You know, Jesus in ministering to people didn't minister to them all in the same way, but they all got the wonderful results of his ministry. So the application of this is as important as the knowledge of it. Lord, help me to apply wisdom. Help me to apply your counsel. Help me to have an understanding heart of what to do with this knowledge. That's really a good prayer. Help me to be silent when I need to be silent. Help me to speak when I need to speak. And the Lord will help us with all of that. So, what's wisdom's way? Wisdom builds. She's a builder. That's what she does. She builds character, stability, strength, self-esteem, confidence, courage. She builds that into us. To those who hear and apply her words. They will not be moved. They're built on a rock. Thank you for watching today's message. If you'd like to know more about today's message or the ministry here at Living Word Fellowship in Knoxville, Iowa, please call 641-828-7119 or visit us online at lwfknoxville.com. If you are in the Knoxville, Iowa area, please stop by and see us on Sundays at 10 a.m., or Wednesdays at 7 p.m. at 321 East Robinson, where there's always something for everyone.